God bless the broken hearted, God bless the widow, and God bless the long departed. We've got no idea what we're doing. God bless the Christian, God bless the atheist, God bless the Muslim, God bless the rest of us. Khalil Sultan is a seasoned motivational speaker with a knack for engaging and inspiring adults and youth through interactive lectures and hands-on workshops. Khalil has crisscrossed Arizona neighborhoods, speaking to social groups, public schools, and at community colleges and universities. Khalil launched his own community outreach program called Today's Youth of America, where his long-term objective is to engage local residents and local businesses as partners in support of economic, academic, governmental, and cultural excellence. Khalil's short-term goals are the restoration of self-esteem, self-value, and self-worth, particularly among the youth he addresses. He inspires young people to respect the family life, to contribute to the economic and social progress of the neighborhoods in which they live by becoming entrepreneurs, to work hard, to think for themselves, and to learn from our great history and struggles, particularly those of the civil rights movement in America. Khalil was born and raised as a Southern Baptist Christian and began researching different religions at, the, at age 19, at 20, he joined the Nation of Islam and soon became a minister traveling in the United States for Elijah Muhammad's proto-Islamic organization. After participating in the Nation of Islam for 10 years in 1975, after the passing of Elijah Muhammad, Khalil transitioned from minister to imam and became a Sunni Muslim, Muslim spiritual and community representative, and evolved out of the proto-Islamic doctrine of the Nation of Islam into the teaching of the world community of al-Islam in America under the leadership of Elijah Muhammad's son and successor, Imam W.D. Muhammad. Imam uh, Muhammad is created with introducing the community to Islam proper, and this is just civil rights history. This is, he has an, I wish, we need to have you back just to talk about civil rights alone. It's incredible history. According to the Quran and the words and actions of the historical prophet Muhammad, as an imam from 1975 until now, Khalil has taught al-Islam in prisons, group homes, colleges, high schools, churches, and in the streets, temples and, and uh, uh, masjids, mosques throughout America. He became friends with boxing legend Muhammad Ali, Imam W.D. Muhammad, Islamic scholar Dr. Jamil Diab, uh, Minister Louis Farrakhan, famed R&B singer Joe Tex, and boxing champion Ernie Shavers, just to name a few. While serving in the U.S. military, Khalil was also blessed with the opportunity to travel across the world, visiting such countries as China, Japan, Hawaii, Hong Kong, and the Philippines. He adamantly believes in the oneness of humanity and envisions the possibilities of a world free from the unnatural burdens of racism, sexism, extreme nationalism, and other forms of social injustices. All in all, Imam Khalil Sultan is committed to doing his share towards the eradication of all obstacles in the way of our expression of true human excellence. He calls me Brother Ryan, so I'm going to introduce him as Brother Imam Khalil Sultan. Let's welcome him. Give him a warm welcome. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Testing. <laughs> I always wanted to say that. <laughs> oh. First of all, we'd like to give all praises to Almighty God, who is referred to as Allah. And we'd like to thank those of you who are present with us today. And we definitely appreciate the invitation to come out and share with you some of our faith, what we believe in, so you can get it straight from the horse's mouth. You get it straight. Um, when I met uh, Pastor Ryan, it was uh, it was that as if we, we I think I was we were going to get together maybe for thirty minutes. I think we get, was together almost two hours. It got so it got so good. It's, it's like I had known him all my life, 
and true believers, people of faith, you know them all your life. You just have not met them in person. But I believe that because we came from one creation, uh, one God, uh, Adam was the father of all mankind. We believe that there's one God of all humanity. We don't believe there's a God for whites and blacks and Indians and everyone else. We believe in the creation of one God for all humanity. You may call it by different names. You know, the name as Muslim uses Allah. And if you were in some parts of the Middle East, you will find there, you ask some of the Christians in certain parts of the Middle East, who is God? And they will say Allah. They mean one God. So that is not strange to some people throughout the world. So we like to, again, say we really appreciate being here. I'm a little clogged up. I have, I wonder if I'm hearing things, that's just my microphone. But it seems like I'm hearing echo. <laughs> Uh, maybe a little drip, uh, jet lag. I was, was, was traveling for the last uh, almost two months, and sometimes I didn't know where I were. You know, I was in <laughs> all over the place. I'd say, "Where am I?" <laughs> you know, but, but there, there was a blessing. Um, I would like to start off by saying, uh, Islam. If we understand the true Islam and the way that it is given to us in the Holy Quran that was given to us by our Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings of be upon him. It is a religion for all of mankind. People think that Islam was a religion for Muslims. Remember, there was no Muslim until Prophet Muhammad came. So everyone came out at the time when he came 1,400 years ago, the people was idol worshippers. They, they worshiped stones and things they made with their hands and stuff like that. So we became Muslim after the Prophet. So Islam is 1,400 years old. Christianity is over 2,000 years old. So Christianity was before Islam. And, and a lot of times people don't realize too that some of the greatest that we had during the time of our prophet was during the time when the Muslim was being persecuted. And guess where he sent the, his Muslim uh, followers for security and for protection? To Ethiopia, which had a Christian king. So the first protection that we had was under the leadership of a Christian king. And they had no problem, the king and his people had no problem with the Muslim because of our faith, our belief, our charity. And then in the Quran it says that closer to you as Muslim will you find those who say we are Christians. Say those are the closest. We do things alike, we have love, we have charity, we fast, we do so many things we do alike. But we only hear about the things we don't do alike. But if we study for ourselves, and that's what Islam is here to teach us, is that we need to study for ourselves. There is extremism, and we're gonna talk about that just for a few, in a few minutes. In all religion, there have been extremism. We have it in Christianity, we have it in Judaism, we have it in Islam, we have it in Buddhism, and when you look, if you really study, there will have been extremism. But whenever the media want to single out a particular group, then that's what we concentrate on is that group. But the media really don't know, realize what they're doing. We have, have had more converts to Islam since 9-11 in America than there ever have been in the history of America at one time. I mean, so people go and they want to see if this religion teaching what these guys done, and they want to study for themselves, so they go and they buy Qurans. Quran, they, they ran out of Qurans one time, they off the shelf, everybody was buying Qurans. And then when they read it, they say, oh, that's not what Islam is. And that's the thing that we encourage you to do, to check it out for yourself, see for yourself. Uh, understand that we're not here as a religion on this earth to remove other religious people and other religious communities. That's not the job of Islam. That's not, that's not what we are here for. Maybe the radicals are here for that, but that's, that's radicals. It's just like doing, there was a time when the KKKK, K, K? <laughs> I, I give them an extra K, you understand? <laughs> they call themselves representing Christianity, you understand? Uh, so we've always had those type of groups that showed up and so it's not just people who call itself Muslim. Now one thing we should think about, if Islam taught what the radicals 
of presenting at Islam, the world would not be any safe. We would have no peace here in America, anywhere in the world. Why? Because we have over 1.6 billion Muslims throughout the world. There are over 30 billion Muslims in Russia. I mean, so there is Muslim everywhere. So wherever you go, you're going to find Muslim. If we were radical, like they tried to present us as, then there would be no peace anywhere. There would be nothing but chaos and confusion and killing and murder and stuff like that. But they know we do not think because we were taught to let some of them think for us. So think for yourself. You know, and some people actually say, I see you in different schools of thought. Schools of thought mean different uh, faith, different following different uh, people in religious ideas or whatnot. But we, in, in America, we are a part of an organization, the World Community of Islam. We're not a people of thought. We are people of thinking. See, we think, because when you thought, someone already thought it for you. <laughs> So we are people of thinking. God gave us the right in our holy book to think for ourselves, not to think what someone else thinks. That's why the scripture is so clear that we can read it for ourselves. Um, we are here to propagate and to testify and to witness of what God has given us in the Quran and in the Prophet Muhammad. If we study the history and life of Prophet Muhammad, there's a book out. I was just at Paradise Valley Community College uh, a month or so ago. And the group was on leadership. We had a leadership luncheon. And I asked them the question. And my question was, there's a book called The 100 Most Influential People That Ever Existed in the World. And inside that book, guess who they list as number one? Prophet Muhammad. And this was not written by Muslims. And why did they listen? Because not only was he a religious leader, he was a secular leader. He was a, he was a, a general. He was an educator. He had all that wrapped into one. See, Islam is not just a religion. Islam is a way of life. We don't separate politics from religion education from religion. In our faith, everything's come in the form of religion. So there's no separation of religion and state. If you fact follow Islam the way that the Prophet Muhammad gave it to the people during that day and time, and we're still following that. And Islam has the original book, the way it was given to the Prophet 1400 years ago. If you read the Arabic text, it's the same language, the same ideas, the same everything that was given 1,400 years ago. Now, we read different interpretations by scholars and people who translate into different religion, okay? And you may see different ideas about it, but that's not, not always the original thing. I remember once when I was a young, young man, there was a, there was a place that uh, I was reading in the Quran, and it says, do not take the Jews and Christians for friends. And if you get a Quran and you read that, you say, whoa. Don't take them for friends. I said, something wrong with this because I didn't read the language, the, the Arabic language. I said, because, you know, my mother, she's Christian. My father's Christian. My sisters and brothers are Christian. Yeah, I was the only one who stepped out and became Muslim. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So I said, I'm going to ask a scholar, what does that really mean in the Arabic language? And it says, do not take that the Jews and Christians are not responsible for protecting your religion. It's not the obligation. That's what it said. But when the, when, the, when the transliterator, when he put it in there, because of his limited knowledge on religion and on, on, the, on the language, then he did the best he could with what he had to work with. So if you see that, it does not mean that. Because I mean, my, all, most of my family are Christians. I was a Christian myself, Baptist, 19 years. And I still love Christianity. Still, I'm still a Christian. Once it's in you, you can't get it out of you. <laughs> oh. We are here to establish ourselves as people serving the good of society and humanity. That's what Islam is. We're here to serve the good of society and humanity. All humanity. Okay? So we 
Like I came in today and I was greeted by so many different people and I mean, I, and one young lady, she stood up and talked about all the love and stuff she had. And, uh, and I said, boy, that sounds like me. Because she said, I love everybody. I'm the same way. But it, it wasn't always that way because I was taught to dislike or to trust or distrust or to hate other people. But when I chose for myself Islam as my way of life, and I saw that it encompassed everyone, the Muslims, the Jews, the Christians, that everyone was included. I said, God is going to judge us according to the book of scripture that we believe in. How much more just can you be than that? And I'm looking at that smiley face right there right now. That's her with the big smile on her face. <laughs> Raise your hand. <laughs> okay. Uh, so we are here to establish ourselves in society to protect and to work and to propagate and make sure that we give the best that we can give for humanity. A few little words I would like to comment on what is Islam, and then we will um, uh, open up for the, uh, for the interview that the pastor is going to do with me. But I like to, one, one word that we always see is uh, throughout the media and television and radio and whatnot is talking about jihad. This is jihad. We are, we are, everyone want to come and fight for jihad. And they inviting, ISIS inviting people all over the world to come and fight for jihad, to struggle, to kill all non-Muslims. And if you're not a Muslim, some of the things we've seen on TV, then we kill you. Uh, and, and if you've got to declare yourself as a Muslim, otherwise you're going to hell. You know, all these things, jihad really, the, the basic meaning for jihad is a struggle. A struggle within yourself to keep out the negative influence of society and the world. To keep Satan out of your heart and your mind and to bring love in. The struggle, you struggle within yourself. I tell people all the time, I do, like I say, uh, the pastor say I do a program in the schools and whatnot. And I put my name on the board, Khalil Sultan. Khalil means a close friend. Sultan means a ruler. And I said, guess who I'm learning how to rule? I said, for 70 years, I've been learning how to rule Khalil. I said, as long as I can control that guy, the world gonna be a good place to live in. <laughs> <laughs> so that's our, that's our challenge, it's us. It's not outside of us, it's in us. You understand, if we have love and compassion and whatnot and charity in our heart, then the world gonna be a better place for us to live, live in. So real quick, I wanna read, it's, what is this extremism in Islam? Extremism is the same as extremism in any ideology. It usually represents a period when man began to believe that he knows better than God how to regulate human affairs. That's what's going on in the world today. They think they know better than God how to regulate human affairs. You understand? So they're killing in the name of God. We hear Allah who Akbar. That's not what Allah who Akbar for. Allah is the greatest, but not for murder of innocent, you know, people who have not done nothing to you, or people who are not at war with you, that's not what El Islam, that's not what religion, and that's not what God gave us, in the, or the Prophet gave us in the Quran. And they have studied the history of the Prophet of Muhammad, and they studied the Quran itself. Those are the two basic keys that we use for our guidance in the world of Islam. So El Islam means the religion of Islam. There's also what they call Islam just peace, but we talk about the peace, the one that God can only give, that's El Islam, the religion of peace. Um, God knows how to regulate his own affairs. The best word for what creates this attitude is ignorance. You, you'll find that most of the people who are in these particular positions are illiterate. They're ignorant. They sit and they listen on someone to come and educate and teach them not themselves, not read for themselves. That's why in Islam, during the month of Ramadan, this is coming up next month, we are obligated as Muslims to fast for 30 days. 30 days from sun up to sundown. We don't eat, we don't drink. We take our lotion, we wash our mouth. You understand? But we spit the water out. Don't drink it and think that God don't you drunk. <laughs> you, understand? you spit the water out. So we have 30 days of fasting. And during that month, Every Muslim who complete the Ramadan, they are required to read the entire Holy Quran from one all the way to the end. There's 114 surahs in the Quran uh, chapters, and we're required to read all the whole book during that month. 
I've been a Muslim now 50 years, so I've read the Quran at least 50 times. You know, so I, I do know a little bit of what was in it. You know, but I study it every day too. I feel that to me, that's my medicine. That's that's how I wake up in the morning with my shot. You understand? And my coffee. I do that in my coffee too. <laughs> Don't believe that out. Um, so in the Quran, the first extremism was called Iblis. Extremism was called Iblis, which is Shaitan, who grew to become known as Satan. So this is how we see Al Islam. And real quick, like I say, uh, the Quran is a book for Muslim, but it's not just a book for Muslim. The prophecy is a book for humanity, for all people. If we study and read the Quran, we will better understand what we have in our scripture. You know, at one time in America, uh, doing from 1930 up to 1975, do you know where is, what Islam was taught from? The King James Version. So that goes to show you. We use the Bible and we encourage as Muslims to study the scripture before to believe in all the prophets, the angels. We're required to do that as Muslims. People don't know that. But we're required to study the books of those before us. I have Bible and Quran together. I study both of them. I read both of them. So that, that is the thing that we have to do. And one other thing I think I would say is that uh, we have the, uh, what they call the uh, Juma prayer, which is on Friday. I think that's one of the questions, I believe that. I think that's one of the questions that we had on uh, what we're going to ask. But real quick, there are five pillars of Islam. One, how do you become a Muslim? You, you take the Shahada, which is declaration of faith. La ilaha Muhammadun Rasulullah. We say there's no God but one God, Allah, and that Muhammad is the messenger and servant of Allah. That's what we do as Muslims. That's how we stand up and we take that oath and that faith. And then prayer five times a day. And let me tell you, prayer five times a day, it's sometimes seems like prayer is coming every hour. <laughs> By the time you get finished saying one prayer, it's time. My, my watch is going off, it's time for another prayer. So it's hard to get into, if you're keeping an established prayer, it's hard to get into negative things if you are trying to keep your obligation to Almighty God. So that's what keep, keep Muslims going, is their five daily prayer. And then the fast during the month of Ramadan, and then charity, and then the hajj, the pilgrimage to the whole city of Mecca, for those who can afford it. That's when the Muslims go together, and they come together, and you will find there is all of humanity, black, white, brown, yellow, red, white, black, Asian, blue, green, everyone is there in the hajj. Sometimes up, up, up to almost two million people coming together for one common cause, and that's for the worship of one God. Thank you very much. May God bless you and hope you. Thank you, Khalil. Have a seat and be comfortable. <laughs> first things first, how often are you mistaken for Morgan Freeman? <laughs> all the time. Yesterday, two different people, sometimes all the time. I remember once, I was sitting in a restaurant and I saw the, the whole, there was a whole table of people. And I saw them just looking, all of them looking. I said, well, so I started checking to see if there's anything on my face. And then finally one of the ladies got enough nerves to come over and ask me, say, uh, are you Morgan Freeman? I said, no. I said, boy, we sure thought you were. You're an honest guy or you could make money on the oh, autographs, yeah. right? <laughs> Guess what? I thought about that. Thank God I, I went and prayed. <laughs> yeah, sure. yeah. Well, thank you for sharing. So, for many of us here, it was potentially the first time we've heard a thoughtful person, a, a, a leader of the Muslim faith speak. Am I right? And, and so this is a day that many of us will remember as an important day in our lives. And I, I appreciate you, all of your work there with Arizona Interfaith and travels and, and, and speaking courageously the way that you do. I want you to know that personally. Just had a few questions. I figured we would, you know, these are common questions that people have. Uh, for Islamic leaders, and, and while we have uh, Imam Khalil here, just be a great time to let you speak you know, off the cuff and answer some questions about your own experience and your own life. And again, I wish we could invite you back just to talk about the civil rights movement alone. Anytime. But uh, first of all, after 9 11, you, you told me this at lunch because I asked you what your ex experience had been like as a Muslim leader. You were doing a, a voter registration drive, you were out in front of a library, right? Yes. What happened to you shortly after 9 11 in that drive? Well, I was, I was doing some voter registration. I'm 
try to be politically active uh, because I know the laws that are being made is made that we got to follow, and especially our kids. More for them than for me. I'm 70 years old, so uh, they have to worry. I have to worry about them. Uh, <coughs> and uh, so I was sitting down, registering people to vote. And this one young man came up. I call everybody young. He's probably in his 60s. <laughs> I'm 70, so he's young. Uh, and he, um, so we had a real nice conversation about, I don't know what we were talking about. We talked about, we was into all kinds of stuff. And the guy was nice and friendly, shook my hand and everything. And he was so nice, I wanted to finish the conversation with him. So I got up and gave him one of my business cards and it had my name on there. And after I gave him my business card, the guy stood up. He says, you one of them Muslims who go around killing people. He said, you are radical. You are. This guy called me all kinds of names. This guy got so irritated and so agitated, I stood up. I was sitting down, but I stood up. <laughs> I said, there's going to be a fight. I want to at least be standing so I can block and do something. And, uh, and so he did, I mean, he would not stop talking. I said, sir, you don't know me. I said, I never killed anybody. I don't have the desire to kill anyone. I said, I believe in humanity. I believe in you know, love for mankind and stuff like that. I said, that's, that's what, who I am. No, you this, you that. So the guy would not stop talking or coming up on me until I got up and walked inside the library to uh, solve, sort, of, sort of break the uh, ice. And he stood at my table for about 10 minutes and just looking to see if I'm coming back out. I'm not coming back out. I'm looking out, inside looking out. And uh, so he finally left. And I said, this guy got my business card. I said, he's going to harass me for the rest of my life. So about 7 o'clock that night, I'm home eating dinner. The phone rang. I answered it. Don't recognize the number. This is so-and-so, so I met you at the live. I said, oh, my God, this guy done started me already. I thought, shoot, this guy was going to just harass me. He said, I called to apologize. Think about that. He said, because you were so nice and kind. You didn't get outraged. You didn't, you didn't insult me or anything else, and I apologize for insulting you the way I did. Never heard from him again, but he called to actually apologize. So you never know. That's why you have to... Treat people the way what's in your heart, not what you can do. You can be angry, but you can control that anger. Yeah, yeah. and another reason I invited you, you're a, a, a good man and a guy who loves baseball, <laughs> right? <laughs> and you love your family, right? and you're involved in, in speaking to youth about things that are just very practical. One of those is avoiding drug use, yes, illegal drug use. Right. Can you share with us why you're so passionate about youth well, avoiding drug use? Well, one thing I'm so passionate use? about youth, is, well, I've always loved, I've been working with young people ever since I was young myself, so uh, I never stopped. But I really had started a program back in 1970, <coughs> teaching kids how to <coughs> self-drug free, how to um, build up self-esteem, setting goals and stuff like that. I do it in the schools and whatnot right now throughout, throughout the state and other places I, that I've gone. And um, I had a son who was, uh, I sent him to the public school. First I was homeschooling him. And then I sent him to the public school in the 10th grade. And he was a, he was a, a straight A student. And in the 12, by the 12th grade, uh, the school sent me back a drug addict. Okay, not the school, but the environment that he's in and the people he's around. So when I say school, I don't mean the school did that, but the environment he was in. And he suffered with those drugs for 15 years on the street. Now he's doing 20 years in prison. He's still got another eight or nine years to do. But he's a, he's a good fellow now. If you met him, you would never know that he ever had a drug in his mouth. But he's a, he's a real, good, real good guy. Matter of fact, he's the, one of the imams inside the prison that he's in right now. So it really changed his life once he got off the drugs. And that's what we got to do. We got to educate and keep our kids drug free because that will destroy your lives. It doesn't make any difference what household they come from, your economics, your education, your religion. It will take them down. It's equal opportunity for destruction. Yeah. So you've experienced some pain that a lot of families experience. Yes. Um, well, to the extremism, and you already did a great job of commenting on that, but just the specific question. How do you and your community respond to violent groups like ISIS and the recent shooting in Garland, Texas? And how, so how do you respond to those? And how do you respond to people who speak against Islam, painting all Muslims as 
these extremists that they see in the media. You, any more to say about that? Well, I would say get to know a good Muslim and you'll love him. Yeah. Uh, get to know a bad Muslim and you'll hate him. <laughs> so choose wisely. Choose and, here, wisely. and here's a good one right here. Can we agree? Yeah. yeah. Thank God. Yeah. And I say the same thing about Christian. Get to know a good Christian and you'll love him. Get to know a bad one and you'll hate him. <laughs> so it, it goes around. And we try and, like I say, we very seldom get the microphone. If you're talking with sense and with rational knowledge about the Quran and about Islam and what Islam means and what it is and what it's not, then you usually don't get the microphone. They give the microphone to the guy who's out there with blood coming out of his mouth or he's, we're going to kill everybody who's not Muslim. They get the microphone. Yeah. And they keep the good microphone away from the ones who are sensible. Yeah. And isn't it true that most Muslims are not Arabs, by the way? Just, yes. just talking about stereotypes? Very small percentage of Muslims are Arabs. Muslims from all over the world. I think it's only maybe about 12 or 13 percent who are actually Arabs. Most Muslims from every walk of life, every color, every nation, you name it, they're from all over the world. We're not limited to no one color. The reason we say that, of course, is that, of course, there's nothing wrong with being an Arab Muslim. Right. The, the media portrayal is often uh, relating to our political relationship with nations like Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, uh, Iran, and so the, that's the stereotype that Americans develop of Muslims, and it's just, right. just making the point that's not true. That's right, right? not true. Um, well, describe a Friday prayer service. What, what goes on there, and uh, just tell us about that. Friday prayer is the, it's like the Sunday for Christians. This is where you come together for your congregation, for your, your, uh, your uh, prayers, for your worship, for your lectures, uh, sermon, whatever terminology you're using. So Friday is for the Muslim. That is the greatest day in Islam for Muslim. We come together, <coughs> and the Friday prayers usually start afternoon, a little after, after, after the noon day. Uh, and Muslims come together, we pray together, we have a lecture, like we did do here, you have a lecture, and then we all join in the congregation of prayer. And it, it is a day when we come together for the worship of the one true God, and that's, it's the same time all over the world. In other words, Juma prayer starts around the same time as far as the, as far as the time zone. Uh, at the same time, and we all come and we pray during that month, during that day, just like we do during Ramadan. The Muslims have one Ramadan, all at the same ram same, same time. So it's the unity, and when we come together for hard, it's all at one time, you understand, for the unity of humanity, not for just any one particular people, why not? So that is when we come together and we pray, and we have our lectures and service about Islam. Is there anything else you'd like to share with us? <clears throat> there may not be, but any, anything else you would like to say here in our time? Well, I would like to say, encourage you to uh, study Islam for yourself, for your own information. Uh, and you will find that Islam is a beautiful religion. It's a way of life. If, if, it, wasn't, if it wasn't beautiful, I wouldn't be in it. Trust me. Uh, there's a lot of ugly things that we see, but that's not what Islam is. That is what someone else is. There's Islam, and I said there's Hislam. H-I-S, Hislam. That's those who decide to go whatever route they want to go and do the thing they want to do, and they name it and put the name Islam on it. So a lot of, of people have taken Islam and become renegades. They run with it to the extreme. In Islam, there's no extremism. That's what the Quran teaches, there's no extremism is not uh, part of El Islam. Islam has always been moderate, it's always been a peaceful religion, uh, and even during the times of war, during the time of the Prophet, the, the Muslim who was fighting uh, the, uh, uh, to protect their faith and protect their religion, they were taught when they go into a town, don't kill the livestock, don't destroy the crops, don't kill uh, women, don't kill children, don't kill the elderly, you only fight those who are fighting with you. That's what Islam is. And if no one is fighting with you, we are never to be the aggressor. We are to defend ourselves, which is a God-given right. But we are never to be the aggressor.
Can we thank uh, Imam Khalil Sautan? Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Really.